My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I am the CEO of After the Fire. Welcome to the podcast, How to Disaster, Recover, Rebuild, and Reimagine. In this podcast, we bring you the very best practices, best hearts, and great ideas from other disaster-affected communities. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to season three of the How to Disaster podcast, where we help you recover, rebuild, and reimagine. During this season, we will be releasing Take Fives, shorter episodes that highlight some of our past guests speaking about similar issues, themes, topics. We wanted to do this so that perhaps it'd be easier if you only have a few minutes, but you wanted to connect with these focused episodes and guests that you could condense all their messages um, into one smaller bite-sized piece. One of the things that we know about disaster is that we really have to meet people where they're at. And sometimes where you're at is you only have five minutes. We're very excited for the third season. We've got great guests and wonderful information and content about how to actually help get your community through to the other side. So thank you for joining us. And if you wish to find out more, please visit our homepage at afterthefireusa.org. Consider giving us a like or follow if you like this podcast. We really appreciate it and thank you for your time. So one of the pieces that I would get really excited about is prescribed fire, um, which is, you know, makes people very, very, very nervous. But as an example, um, wandering around with my grandfather when you know, I was five or six, he would light patches on fire and just sit there with a shovel and put them out of, with the shovel if they got out of control. And that used to be a much larger landscape application by my family. Um, I, I did a prescribed burn last year, 33 acres. And when I was calling all of our neighbors, they became, well, very nervous and, and rightfully so because we had just we were literally in the middle of the Wallbridge fire when I was proposing to do a prescribed fire. Um, but all of them were recent. Uh, they, they'd moved here within the last generation or so. That's recent to us, um, except for this older gentleman across the highway that had been ranching in my grandmother's time. And when I called him, he said, well, you know, I, we used to do that in the flats all the time until the government told me we couldn't anymore. Um, and so for him, it was just a way of life that uh, was something that we couldn't, that wasn't allowed anymore. And so he was actually very excited to hear that that was coming back and to learn about how he could possibly do that again as well. Yeah. And we're not making a, we're making a living, not a killing at this work. <laughs> you know, the people that we work with, we're passionate about it. We care about it. But I, I wanted to share one quick story. There was a fire that came, that happened in April, late April, in one of the areas we've worked. It's within the Klamath Reservation Forest. The Fremont Wyneman National Forest, a town called Bly, Oregon. It's pretty rural, but we uh, implemented a project with uh, a tribal workforce and in partnership with the Klamath tribes um, several years back. And that fire, that fire was a human caused fire and it burned. They, they had all their resources on it. It was very early pre fire season, but it was dry. And the areas that weren't treated burned really high in intensity, stand replacing. Um, or scorched a lot of big trees. And the area that we treated, we, we thinned it, we commercially ecologically thinned it using local operators. We did an A to Z project, meaning we, we did all the marking, the prescription, we, we did a whole training around it. And then we burned the slash and then we underburned. That fire came back into that stand and, and it stayed completely on the ground. It burned at low intensity, all the pine are still there. And we just recently did a, a community tour of that area with a, through a tribal workforce program. And it was amazing to see the results of the fire next to the area and the fire that had been um, unburned or, or burned. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking to set the stage that our communities can be more resilient, our ecosystems can sustain because we care about these large old trees and the diversity and that people have good, meaningful paying jobs, good livelihoods, right livelihoods, working in their communities caring for their land and um, caring for their community. You know, when I first got involved with this work and I, you know, I, I think you always need to go to the boots on the ground people to figure out what's going on. 
And so I um, talked to our local CAL FIRE, you know, vegetation management team members. And I said, well, how do you prioritize where work needs to happen? And they said, well, we get in our trucks and we drive around and we look for problem areas. And I said, but you have maps theoretically of, you know, where fuels are hazardous or where there's high fire severity risks. And they said, yeah, but those are statewide maps. And this is a lot of the work that Pepper gets involved with. It's a statewide map. It's intended to give decision makers in Sacramento a snapshot of conditions. It's not really meant to be used for planning exactly where to do work on the ground. Um, so we were excited um, because we've been very involved with using new kinds of data sources, um, sensors that can be put on airplanes, sensors that can be put on satellites to help map these forest resources. And that technology is just getting good enough now that you can really start to see individual trees. <laughs> and we can fly an airplane over with a laser and get through a 3D map of the forest structure, which is not just the top of the canopy and the number of trees, and that's the big focus, but what's underneath. So a lot of what we've learned is that the risk of fire is really correlated with um, how dense what we call the vegetation fuels are in the sub canopy, the stuff that's growing close to the ground. It's shrubby, it's young dug fir saplings, and we call those ladder fuels. Those are fuels that the fire will climb up um, those smaller trees or shrubs and get up into the canopy. And we we're able to show that these ladder fuels combined with a, a drought metric, which my team had developed, were the two best predictors of where the canopy burned off in 2017. That was a study done with with NASA. Fannie Mae provides mortgage options for you and your family. If you have a mortgage owned by Fannie Mae, you may have financial options available after a disaster, such as forbearance plans, deferral of payments, lending assistance, and counseling. Find out more from our Disaster Response Network. Go online at www.knowyouroptions.com relief or call 1-877-833-1746. Today. So Match.Craze is, is a California currently, but hopefully soon the world um, program that will match grazers with fallow lands. So if, say if you have brushy uh, land, you can go out there and you can find some goats. Or if you have large amounts of grassland, you report that you have grassland and you, know, they, you can bring in some sheep or some cattle to eat that down. Uh, it was created by the uh, University of California Extension. Uh, it's, they like to call it a uh, dating service for grazing. And it has been a wild success. Uh, one, of, one of the issues with not that, that um, website, but in general in California is that there's not a lot of agriculturalists left. Um, I don't have enough goats right now and I've been building my herd for five or six years to graze my own property, much less my neighbors. And so getting young people involved in agriculture, I think there's going to be this new push because, you know, as I said earlier, we don't make a lot of money. But if there's a way that you can graze, sell the meat from these animals and also get paid to do mitigation on properties, I can see a lot of the brain drain that we're experiencing in Sonoma County of young people leaving because it's a rural area. and There's not a lot of opportunities staying because there is a viable way to make money and contribute to, to keeping your community protected and fed at the same time. You know, what first surprised me is that we were even surprised, right? Because as scientists, we knew that we lived in a fire adapted ecosystem and it was likely to happen to us sooner or later. And even though we had that information, you know, we were just as shocked and impacted as anyone else in the community. Um, We've been doing a lot of work to uh, connect indigenous people and indigenous knowledge to our Western scientific knowledge. And um, I think, first of all, just understanding that the state of the forest as we in the 20th century look at it, um, it actually reflects from a Native American point of view, a lack of stewardship. And so we knew at Pepperwood that um, we had about 10 times as many trees per unit area as probably were there historically under native stewardship. Um, and this is because we largely stopped fire from coming in to, you know, we've been really good at putting fires out. And so in our area, which is characterized by these gorgeous, you know, oak woodlands or hardwood and mixed montane hardwood, 
say compared to the Sierras where you have mostly um, uh, coniferous trees, um, meaning like Christmas trees, um, you know, the forest has really changed dramatically from what would have been a more sustainable framework. And yet we're very attached to the way it looks today. Difficult. And that's difficult because I'm an Aboriginal person. And so I'm going to be trying to be careful here and speak a little bit, though, for the animals and the wildlife that don't have a voice. Okay. And we kind of took their territory. You know, people kind of moved in on territory that um, maybe we didn't think it out real good. Um, maybe we could go rethink some of the planning um, in how we develop. And now that we know more, maybe we can do better. And so it, again, it is our responsibility individually and collectively to take all the good information in that we have now all the best practices that we have now, and really possibly rethink and redesign what we're doing. And that American dream to some was American nightmare to others. And that's where we need to come back to a base point of reference of where do we go from here? And how do we all get there from here? And so every community with its geographical differences, with uh, um, people differences, with all the diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that deep thought, and um, again, that collaborative partnership um, approach, that whole community approach to where do we go from here, probably needs to be rethought. And we all need to make changes in order to address this climate chaos that we're in. And we got ourselves here. We got ourselves here. And we can get ourselves out or we can mitigate damages. There, there's changes that need to be made. And we need to think about uh, those, the animals, our elders tell us, think about the fish, the wildlife, uh, the generations that are coming after us. Are we making decisions for those seven generations that are coming in the future? And I think when we stop and we can get a little bit of that Aboriginal thought process going, we're all going to be possibly gentler with ourselves and maybe a little bit wiser about the decisions that we're making for ourselves and our communities and where we build. Thank you for joining us on the podcast, How to Disaster. For more information, please visit our website at afterthefireusa.org. And if you liked this video, please hit subscribe. Fannie Mae provides mortgage options for you and your family. If you have a mortgage owned by Fannie Mae, you may have financial options available after a disaster, such as forbearance plans, deferral of payments, lending assistance, and counseling. Find out more from our Disaster Response Network. Go online at www.knowyouroptions.com relief or call 1-877-833-1746.